Good evening and welcome to the Orkney International Science Festival online and to this evening's event, Composing by Numbers. The great Scottish physicist, James Clerk Maxwell, who established the nature of light and laid the foundations for much of modern physics, came from a glitteringly talented family. His great-great-grandfather was Sir John Clark of Penny Cook, lawyer and judge, architect and landscape gardener, and accomplished composer who studied in Italy under Corelli. Our speaker this evening is Dr John Purser. Um, welcome, John. It's wonderful to have you with us this evening. Hi there, Heather. Dr Purser is renowned for his groundbreaking series for BBC Radio Scotland in 1992. The series was titled Scotland's Music and covered 3,000 years to the present day. The book of the series won him the McVitie's Prize for the Scottish Writer of the Year. For his work on the project, he drew on his skills and experience as a musicologist and music historian. He's also a composer and a researcher at, and I must apologise, my Gaelic pronunciation is appalling, the Sabal Mor Ostag. Perhaps you can correct me there, John. How is that pronounced in, in Sky? Salmor Ostig. Salmor Ostig. The Gallic College in, in Sky. <laughs> <laughs> it's a pleasure to have this with you, John. Um, for our viewers watching, if you have any um, questions for our speaker this evening, please enter them into the YouTube live chat and there will be a bit of an opportunity to ask some questions at the end. Well, over to you. Well, now, hopefully this is working for everybody. And my title, Composing by Numbers, may seem a little odd, you know, about doing pictures by numbers, which is dead easy. You fill in the numbers when you're a little kid. Uh, we've heard about what a remarkable character Clark of Pennycook was already. But the time that I'm talking about was when he was in his teens. So this, we're talking about the compositions of a lad who was, 18 or 19 at the time, this great great grandfather of James Clark Maxwell. So I've sort of looked for any connections that there might be between the two of them over this extraordinary distance of time. And I have that quotation there on your first slide. She took up a book of her magical learning and prepared in prophetical numbers to sing. And that's James Clark Maxwell, who was really keen on music. Uh, and <clears throat> obviously uh, also interested in number, goes without saying. Um, now I have to get to the next slide and there we are. That's the pair of them. And have, just have a look at those faces. Um, the similarities between them, they're both of them as young men. The one by Mieris on the left of John Clark of Penny Cook is when he was 19. And the other one, uh, James Clark Maxwell in his twenties. The Maxwell bit, by the way, is an add-on. His proper name was James Clark. <clears throat> now, that may look a bit weird to you, and it is a bit weird, uh, but I'm taking you on a Dan Brown adventure, if you like, and yes, we will be visiting Rosslyn Chapel. Um, these are the number values of alphabets as used by Clark of Pennycook in round about 1698. Uh, so you've got the Hebrew one there and the Hebrew alphabet and the numbers associated with each letter. And you look down at the bottom one and the European numbers associated with each letter. And for those of you who are interested in these things, just note that I and J are the same as they were in Latin and U and V. So <clears throat> there you are. Those are the numbers. How do I know that this is of any relevance at all to anything? Well, take a look at this next one here. Let's take a very simple name like Bach, as in J.S. Bach. And you look at B is obviously the number two, and A is the number one, and C is the number three, and H is eight. What does it up, add up to? It adds up to 14. But J.S. Bach adds up to 41, which is 14 written backwards. Now, we know that Bach knew about this and used it because in his very last composition, when he was dying on his deathbed, he wrote a choral prelude for Dein und Thron Tretich Hirmit. Before thy throne I place myself, O God, and it ends with the words, 
Hör mich, hear me. Now, if God was going to listen to anybody, it was J.S. Bach. But the chorale tune is a beauty. <clears throat> and the first phrase of it, Bach engineered it so that it, there were 14 notes in the first phrase and 41 notes in the whole chorale. And he had it accompanied and the accompaniment to where the, the chorale goes, ta -da -da -di -a -da -di -da -di -dum. the accompaniment goes, Da, 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 de, da, 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 which is the thing upside down, i.e. 14 and 41 in reverse. So there is a certain proof that this kind of thing was being used by the greatest of composers who happened to be a contemporary of Clark's. So I'm not entirely way out here, and the world of Dan Brown is actually a very real world. It's not a fantasy, it's not a novel. This is stuff that was going on and in people's minds. So <clears throat> Clark would have known about this kind of thing. Now, I've had a bit of a battle with musicologists about this who are reluctant to go into these uh, areas, but it's really Clark's use of the numbers is so frequent, it's impossible to deny it. Uh, but also, uh, it's worth pointing out, it's not difficult to incorporate these features in a piece of music I'm a composer. It, you can easily adjust the number of bars. It doesn't make the music any better. What it does do is it tells you what was going on in the composer's mind. And that is fascinating. <clears throat> so here you are, here's some of the stuff that he did. Uh, he used the name Elohim. Now I remember ringing up an expert in these matters and I said, this piece of music has three sections of 86 bars long. 86, he said, did you say 86? I said, yes, what does that mean? He says, well, it's a sacred number for Elohim. Everybody knows that. Well, I didn't know her. Anyway, so there you are. He has 86 bars three times in the same work. Why? Because it's a setting of Miserere Mei Deus, which is a psalm, Psalm 51, in which David is <clears throat> asking God to forgive him for his having lusted after Bathsheba. Now, whether Clark had been lusting after somebody he shouldn't have lusted after, I don't know. But this is a very personal cantata, and he's got God's name in there, and also, I might add, Yehoshua, or Jesus' name, in there in the number symbolism, presumably in the hope that he will be forgiven. <clears throat> and <laughs> now, the next one down here in the Latin and the English one is rather different, um, because if we add up the numbers for uh, Bedford, we get 52, and Bedford was his chum, his teenage chum, when he was in Italy. And 72 is Howland, which is Bedford's fiancé's family name. We will come to that later. But in the meantime, I'm going to take you into another world of mystery, because Dan Bright has got his fingerprints all over this whole damn thing. Here we are. And this is <clears throat> number symbolism without gematria, without numbers representing letters. So how many times have you walked down the street and you've looked at house numbers, 9, 10, 11, 12, 12A, 14? Because people don't want their house numbered 13. They're su superstitious about it. So there are lots of superstitions about it. In any time you've had a child baptized in a church, almost certainly the font was octagonal, not always, but usually. And that because it represents a number of regeneration. So new baby, New generation, simple. But when I was going through this piece, next piece that we're coming to, which I am going to give you a, a music example from, it came in uh, numbers of 11 bars. Now this is unheard of. Nobody writes in 11 bars, 12 bars blue, blues. Yes, everybody knows that. And when I was copying out the parts and I reached bar 11 and I realized I'd come to the end of a section, I thought, oh, damn it, I've missed a bar. And I went back and I had not missed a bar. So again, I asked my friend in Northern Ireland and he said, oh, 11 is the number of tribes of Israel given land. And 22, which was the next pause in the music, is the number of kings between the founding of the Temple of Solomon and its final rebuilding by Darius and the return of the Jews from exile. So what that got to do with anything? Well, <coughs> Clark used these numbers and we'll see why. 
In the 1790s, Scotland was trying to found a colony in Darien in New Caledonia to command the Panama Isthmus. It was very ambitious. It was failed totally. And the English and Spanish in particular tried to wreck it. Um, <clears throat> anyway, this is the reason that Clark has his piece based on multiples of 11, because 11 is the number of tribes of Israel given land, and the clans of Scotland are the tribes of Israel, and they're going to build the new Jerusalem in the new world. So that was the whole idea of it, and it was given uh, biblical authenticity by the 66 section, uh, bar section, which is the number of, by, of books in the Protestant Bible. So let's have a listen to the opening music, which is protesting at the English and Spanish. Quite right, too. Splendid stuff, and it's just such a shame that James Clark Maxwell never heard this, because this music essentially has not had not been heard for 200 years until we managed to get it revived in the late 20th century. Okay, I promised you Rostlin Chapel, and here we are, founded by William Sinclair in 1456. Now, it was right next door to Clark's estate, then the Clarks, I may say, still live on the estate. Um, and in the image below, you can't read it very well, and in any case, it's in rather an obscure kind of alphabet, is a quotation from Esdras. And it's about the, uh, what the events that led to the return of the Jews from exile and the rebuilding of the Temple of Solomon by Cyrus and Darius. Darius completed it. So <clears throat> what we have here is Clark who, who renovated this building, um, very conscious of the fact that the building was an, in itself an attempt to uh, rebuild the Temple of Solomon, to bring the ideals of the Temple of Solomon to Scotland. And these were going to be transported via Leo Scotti Aeritatis, as it were, in the uh, Scottish colony in Darien. So here's the next example from the same cantata. And this is <clears throat> very interesting. Uh, the example is from a 27 bar long movement. And that represents the perfect cube. Three, three is a nine, three, nine is 27. So it was the house of the Ark of the Covenant was a perfect cube. And what did the Ark of the Covenant contain? It contained the tablets of law handed down to Moses from Mount Sinai. Clark was studying law, so he knew all about this. Now, in this particular movement, the soprano is addressing fortune and extolling the ambitions of the Scottish colony to bring praise, righteousness, law, religion, and justice to the new Jerusalem and Darien. And the music you're seeing there shows two of the nine occurrences of a three-bar ostinato, that's a repeated pattern in the bass line, representing the wheel of fortune 
rising and falling. And you'll hear the whole movement now. You can hear, if you listen to the bass line, you'll hear the Wheel of Fortune rising and falling, rising and falling, rising and falling. Um, and the whole thing symbolic of uh, the law, justice and equity that Scotland was going to bring to the new world. <laughs> Dream on. Wait. Sorry about that. There we go. Well, I'm afraid all these pleadings to fortune did no good at all. Uh, the <coughs> colony was a complete failure. Now, moving on to a slightly different tack, and that is to do with the relationship of music with mathematics and proportion in particular. And the idea that music was related to proportion goes way back to Pythagoras and basically has been understood by physicists and musicians ever since then, no argument about it. Uh, the biggest book on it, uh, which was the received textbook in the medieval period is Boethius, and he has proportions of six figure numbers to six figure numbers. So like the proportion of 365137 to 237052, work that out if you want. I, I can't make my way through Boethius, but this was standard fare in the medieval period. In 1721, another uh, contemporary of Bach's and of uh, Clark's was Alexander Malcolm, and his treatise of music was published in Edinburgh in 1721 and is still very highly regarded. And he uh, propounded the physical theory, and it, he wasn't the first, based on the motion of atoms looking back to Lucretius. But Malcolm was a modernist as well, and he liked modern music, so uh, Clark would have fitted in all right. Um, and <clears throat> there's wonderful uh, uh, verses which, uh, at the start of uh, Malcolm's book, which are basically saying uh, that music is the uh, theory is, is at the basis of the music of the spheres, that everything depends upon music. And Boethius, Kepler, even Newton uh, accepted the idea of the music of the spheres. Um, Clark Maxwell didn't care for Lucretius, who sort of uh, <clears throat> helped start, uh, helped continue this idea. But nonetheless, I think he was uh, very much uh, involved in a love of music. Now, um, a, here, uh, something getting in the way of the text at the top there. But anyway, um, the. In the treatise, he speaks of the motion of these particles next to the smallest Malcolm, this is, which is supposed to be the immediate cause of sound. And of these, only those next to the surface can communicate with the air, and so on of this kind. It's an atomic theory of sound, how sound reaches your ear. 
And the reason I mentioned Lucretius is that in actual fact, he figures on the front page of Malcolm's treatise of music, uh, <clears throat> which he speaks of it as the delight of gods and men. Um, divum hominumque voluptas. Now, <clears throat> as I say, Maxwell wasn't too keen on Lucretius, and he wrote quite humorously, first then let us honour the atom, so lively, so wise and so small, the atomist next let us praise, Epicurus, Lucretius and all. Now this of course is, is very sarcastic, um, <laughs> but <clears throat> nonetheless, I, I don't know what um, James Clark Maxwell thought about the idea of the music of the spheres. I imagine it, 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 he'd grown well out of it by then. But nonetheless, he was very, very keen on music and would have accorded it a major place. <clears throat> Here, for instance, but listen what harmony holy is mingling its notes with our own. The discord is vanishing slowly and melts in that dominant tone. And they that have heard it can never return to confusion again. Their voices are music forever and join in the mystical strain. No mortal can utter the beauty that dwells in the song that they sing. They move in the pathway of duty. They follow the steps of their king. I would barter the world in its glory, that vision of joy to prolong, or to hear and remember the story that lies in the heart of their song. So this matches in many ways the sentiments in the poem at the beginning of Malcolm's Treatise by Mitchell. <clears throat> but we haven't time to linger on that. Let's move on to uh, this idea of uh, music producing harmony out of discord. And for Clark, what was really remarkable is that it was reflected in architecture. And some years later, when he took over charge of the Holy State, um, he actually built a tunnel through a, a ridge on the estate and had in the middle of it a sort of grotto with shells. And this is how he describes the tunnel. No one can get across to it but by the mouth of a frightful cave. To those who enter, therefore, first occurs the memory of the cumin syllable, symbol for the ruinous aperture blocked up with stones and briars strikes the eye. And then, then comes upon the wayfarer a shudder as they stand in doubt whether they are among the living or the dead. As indeed certain discords set off and give finish to musical cadences in such a way as to render the subsequent harmony more grateful to the ear. Well, there you see the uh, exit to the tunnel, to the Hurley Tunnel on Clark's estate, and it is still there. And this is a very serious piece of music, uh, a dark piece by uh, Clark representing um, the sorrow and darkness that you feel when you enter as opposed to when you exit the tunnel. Ah. There we go. And that's all we have time for there, I'm afraid. Um, just to show that in architecture, Clark uh, <clears throat> was also very much involved in the idea of sound. And this house which he designed with Adam in body and classical proportions is called Mavis Bank House. We don't have time to listen to the first movement of the violin sonata, uh, but uh, he composed that again, 86 bars in length incorporating the sacred name of Elohim. And I can only guess that he was worried because for a Presbyterian to be writing fiddle music in those days was possibly by some Presbyterians considered 
you know, the music of the devil on the fiddle, and that by incorporating God's name into the number of bars in the sonata, he was maybe making it okay for himself. But I'm going to finish off <clears throat> with a really wonderfully sportive thing. He had a teenage chum when he was in Italy, Rottersley Russell Marcus of Tavistock, soon to be Duke of Bedford, and who Clark already knew as Bedford. And they were in Rome together in 1698. Now, Bedford was married to Elizabeth Howland in 1695, but he was 15 and she was 13. So the couple were too young for the marriage to be consummated until 1698. So this cantata that uh, Clark wrote for Rottersley Russell leaving Rome to go to his young wife was not a wedding cantata, but a bedding cantata. And the really witty way that he does this is that <clears throat> the 52 bars represent the name of Bedford and 72 bars represent uh, the name of Howland. And in the last movement, he used 52 along with 72. Uh, so what it is, is that the last moon 72 bars long, but the first 20 bars are orchestral introduction. And then the soprano sings. Why? Because there's 52 bars left, and that's when Bedford enters, as it were. Um, so uh, here it is, um, and uh, this is uh, the opening of it here. It illustrates lovemaking, and I leave it up to you to understand that. Uh, there we go. Well, there you are. That's me finished. I just ask you to have a look at those two faces and note in them the candor, humor, grace and intelligence. Were these inheritable qualities, one might fairly assert, a shared geometry of character. So thank you very much for listening. Thank you. That was fascinating stuff. Um, you know, and absolutely wonderful to hear of some, some experts of the music. And it's a shame we didn't have a little bit longer to hear a little bit more. Um, but yeah, absolutely stunning. We, we have had a few questions coming in. Um, we've got uh, one from Julie who's asking, is composing by numbers, is this the ultimate collaboration of left and right sides of the brain in action? Beautiful music with, you know, the, the number codes. What, what do you think? Well, I think that's a very interesting question. Um, I think most musicians use both sides of their brains anyway. Speech is normally associated with one side of the brain and emotion with the other side. 
but speech is generally understood to be derived from music, a development of music in the brain. And it is very interesting that uh, music is frequently used with people who have suffered severe brain damage, strokes and this kind of thing. And it awakens them in many respects. Uh, there's a wonderful work by an American psychologist um, whose name escapes me for a minute, but anyway, uh, uh, about this. Uh, so yes, I, I would say, you know, it's a broad, very simplistic answer uh, to that question. Yes, I think it does connect the left and right hand side of the brains, but the composing by numbers is only a tiny or sportive example of it. It's, it's, it's playful. And we must remember this was, this was a game for Clark uh, and the music, you don't have to incorporate gematria, number symbolism in your compositions to make them uh, either beautiful or beautifully constructed, if it comes to that. Um, this was just, it's an insight into what was going on in his mind. But thank you for the question, because it's an interesting one. Absolutely. You, you, you talk about, oh, this was, you know, uh, this is fun, you know, for him, to, you know, to, 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 you don't have to do it in this way. Um, was there any evidence that you've come across of, um, you know, the arrangements being arranged into sort of certain uh, numeric codes, as it were, you know, were there, say, three players or four players, or, you know, was that, were, were the arrangements of the number of musicians, perhaps, you know, was there any evidence of that also being uh, governed by numbers, as it were? Not to my knowledge. No, I don't think of that. I think, <clears throat> I think it's simply the bar numbers uh, that he used. And this is, the way it's normally done or else the number of notes as Bach used, as I indicated in the talk. Another Scottish composer called William Wallace used Gematria a great deal in a creation symphony he composed in which he not only uses the number of 86, just like Clark did, but he also manages to incorporate his own and his fiance's name in the piece. So they're kind of like Adam and Eve in Eden at <laughs> the creation of mankind. It's, it's pretty ambitious stuff. Wonderful, wonderful symphony. Um, so uh, yeah, it's, that's all I can say. I don't think it really attaches to the number of players, uh, which could be a movable feast anyway. Absolutely. Thank you. I've got a, a few, a few other questions uh, before we, um, continue. Um, we've got one from Richard, who is asking, do you think the patterns of music fit well with the patterns of mathematics and the pattern and do the patterns of classical music help assist when trying to carry out complex thinking? <sighs> oh, cripes, that's a, that's a hard one. That's not fair. <laughs> that's a real googly. Um, <laughs> Good question. The patterns uh, the patterns that you create when you're composing, and I've composed a very great deal in my time, um, and also in writing poetry, uh, where you are creating patterns, which are often used to be called numbers. The poetry was described as being in numbers. Um, you are constantly aware of form, or you should be constantly aware of the formal patterns that you are creating and balancing them. But how you balance them is based very largely on instincts. And these instincts, in my case, are not derived from mathematics. All the mathematics brains in my family went to my brother. Um, and I have none of them at all. But I still have a perfectly good sense of proportion. Thank you very much. And <laughs> I, can, I know what I'm doing when I'm shaping a piece of music or I'm shaping a poem. And, uh, I can only say that those in instincts are derived partly from years and years of study, of course, and studying the works of others, um, but not specifically from mathematics. Now, one composer who did operate virtually directly from mathematics was the uh, great Greek composer, Yanis Xenakis, uh, but there's hardly another composer ever that has been as brilliant as he was at it, uh, both a fine mathematician, a great composer and a very fine architect. He brought them all together. 
but that is absolutely exceptional that that really isn't anybody to touch Zanakis in that field. So broadly speaking, I would say that no, uh, the way you uh, establish form, balance, proportion um, is not dictated uh, by any mathematical sense or doesn't have to be, but can be. Mm, absolutely. Thank you. Oh, well, we've got um, a slightly different uh, flavour of question from Richard, who is asking you, why do you think that Clark's work lay undiscovered for so many years? Because it seems to have such great structure and sound. Uh, well, that's really quite simply answered. It existed only in manuscript. And mm -hmm. those manuscripts were kept among the Clark papers in the Scottish National Records Office. And I went in and studied those and I made my own editions for the Scotland's music series back in 1991-92. And we had special performances done of them. But at the same time, the great Scottish musicologist, Dr. Kenneth Elliott, was working on editions of these. And I, I think it would be fair to say, jump the gun for the sake of the radio programs to get these pieces of music out there. Um, but it was Kenneth who did the real serious scholarship work on them. Anyhow, uh, we managed, and before Kenneth's edition came out, uh, we managed to get uh, Concerto Caledonia and Catherine Bott, who was the people that you heard, um, make a CD of all the cantatas, and it's absolutely brilliant. And Catherine the singer, oh God, she was stunning. And in the last one there, which is so cheeky and with all its sexual implication, she was just absolutely bouncing like a bloody ball with it. She had such fun and the audiences loved it too. <laughs> Fantastic. If um, any listeners wanted to um, listen to more of that music, where, where would we be able to find that? It's on uh, the CD, Lion of, uh, hold on, it's called uh, Lion of Scotland. I have it here and it's Concerto Caledonia, the Lion of Scotland. Can you see that there? Lion of Scotland. The Lion of Scotland, Concerto Caledonia, and the subtitle is Cantatas by John Clark of Pennycook. And it's on the Hyperion label. Hyperion Clark will get it. And it's stunning. It's well worth it. It's probably now downloads, but whatever. Um, it's, it's absolutely terrific. The performances are top notch. Brilliant. Excellent. I have to look that up after, after this. <laughs> Fantastic. Well, we've got um, a few more questions yet. Um, we've got another one asking, do you think that the laymen and women of the time were aware of the symbolism in the compositions or was it just the select few who were aware of, of the implications? Well, given that these pieces were only performed either privately, or, well, they really were only performed privately, uh, even the cantata for Bedford, uh, of course, people didn't have the opportunity to know, but the general educated Presbyterian would be aware of gematria. Of that, there is no doubt at all. You, if you learned the Hebrew, Hebrew at all, and Hebrew was a vital part of the theological courses in Scottish universities at that time. Um, if you learned Hebrew, even learning the alphabet, you had to learn the number values of the letters. Uh, and uh, I, I don't speak Hebrew. Uh, I'm not really au fait with that culture at all. But I know that that number symbolism is, is very significant. So if you had drawn people's attention to uh, the fact that um, uh, Miserere Mei Deus has three sections of 86 bars long, a good deal, a fair proportion of your educated uh, listeners would recognize at once that that was a sacred number, sacred number for the name of God, the Elohim. Um, but elucidating this in modern times, we're not used to this kind of symbolism. And as I say, I have met with a certain amount of resistance to it. Um, 
but there's a very beautiful example from Robert Carver in the 16th century when he wrote a 19 part motet, O Bonne Jesu, for the name of Jesus. A high 19 parts. And the answer is quite simple. It's the nomon of uh, um, two cubed and three cubed. Two cubed is two by two by two, which is eight, and three cubed is 27, like we, we had in Leo Scotti Aere Tartus for the perfect cube. 27 is the three dimensional masculine number, the first three dimensional masculine number. Eight is the first three dimensional feminine number. What is the nominal difference between these? It is 19. It is a perfect number. It is the perfect human. Now, Plato used this number in his Timaeus. This was known right throughout the medieval period. And Carver uses it. Why? Because he is writing a piece in honor of the perfect being. Christ, in his opinion, anyway, that was. So um, it's an, an extraordinary symbolic use of uh, a number which had mathematical, some very simple mathematical significance. Gosh. Oh, fascinating stuff. Thank you. Gosh. Um, I've got uh, another question uh, for you <laughs> asking, isn't it true that number patterns form the basis of anything that has an aesthetically pleasing pattern? And you know, is that true of, of music as well, in your opinion? Well, the thing is that when you're reaching complex pieces of music, particularly classical pieces of music, but even very simple pieces can be much more complex than you might imagine, um, the uh, detecting of the proportions of the laws of growth, of expansion, uh, would become incredibly complex. I think, you know, even your biggest computers would have real, real problems analyzing what is actually going on in a Beethoven symphony in terms of the proportion of one section to another, of one little melodic fragment to another. Um, so I, I don't... I don't think you could demonstrate it. I mean, I know that you can sort of take a shell or a flower or a cell and so on, and you can demonstrate that the growth patterns are essentially obeying the same laws, whether, you know, and DNA and all of these, uh, there are fundamental laws. But when you start taking this to the art of music, which is one of the highest achievements of humanity, and we do class ourselves as being at the top of the tree, from that point of view, well, we've not seen anybody else higher up other than God, and I haven't seen him or her. Uh, so, uh, you know, here we are, as it were, at the extremity of our capacities, writing very complex artistic works, which require tremendously complex presentation physically, you know, I mean, for a pianist or a fiddler in classical music, they're right at the edge of what the brain is actually capable of commanding fingers to do. Then I think asking, can you analyze this? Can you demonstrate that this is related to the laws of, of growth and proportion and all the rest that we can see in the world of plants and so on? Well, I would say you're yeah, welcome to try, but <laughs> I don't think you've got a hope in hell. <laughs> Gosh, thank you very much. We're sort of coming towards the end of our time, but we're not quite there yet. So we've got time for one or two more. Um, I've got a, a comment um, from Richard, um, and this must be in what we were speaking about before. And he says, yes, but the right side of the brain controls the left-hand side of the body. Therefore, left-handed people are right-minded. <laughs> well, that's a piece of impudence if ever I heard it. <laughs> Gosh. And we've got a, a, oh, a question for me. Um, um, as a fiddle player, would I notice such patterns in playing these compositions? Well, I've been thinking about this and, well, John, you won't know this, but I play, play the fiddle um, and a lot more traditional stuff. I'm quite interested in the repetition and the number of bars, and that's really important for, for dance music. 
but yeah, I would certainly re recognize patterns, perhaps rather than like as you're discussing the expansion like the shells and the growth patterns. You don't really, uh, yeah, like you say, how would, on earth would you calculate that? But perhaps it's more repetition and patterns forming. But I don't know what, what you think, John, about um, um, the, the repetition. And is it sort of, do you think, likened to waves and things like that? Well, yes, but wave theory takes you way out into outer space. Um, so I, I don't think I want to engage with that. Dance, I can handle a little bit more readily. Um, and obviously the patterns of dance involving the physical movements of the dancers require uh, accuracy and repetition is very helpful. But if you move to the slow airs, now you're from Orkney, so you, and you're a fiddler, so you must play the day doors. Yes. <laughs> yes. Well, it's one of the most beautiful of tunes it ever was. Now, I wouldn't want to analyze that tune. Go mm -hmm. ahead and analyze it if you want, but I wouldn't do it if I were you, because I think you will end up with nothing but notes and you will have lost the incredible beauty and magic of that tune, which should only really be played at New Year. Um, one of my very favorites. Uh, you could say that, you know, the octave leap in it kind of creates a sort of expansive sense and it goes round and round on itself, often and often. I want to sing the whole thing. It's, it's so lovely. But I refuse to analyse it for you. <laughs> Well, I think what a beautiful note to end on, you know, perhaps there's some things we should, you know, you can't analyse, that we just enjoy them for their beauty. Um, so I, I have to say thank you so much for, for joining us this evening. It's been, it's, been, it's been great and really enjoyable. So thank you so much um, to Dr. John Purser for your time with us this evening. My pleasure. Good night. And of course, Thank you to all the folk asking questions on the YouTube. It's been it's been really interesting. So thank you very much for generating some discussion for us. And a little bit of housekeeping. Our next event in the program is tomorrow uh, morning at half past eleven. We'll feature the story of Sir John Clark's distinguished great great grandson, the physicist James Clark Maxwell. The day will begin at 10 a.m. with news of recent progress in detecting gravitational waves. And of course, you can catch the end of the festival club tonight and there'll be a link to the festival club on the website but in the meantime thank you again for, for coming to watch and good night and goodbye <laughs>